I know that chances of my brother not going to be hanged is very slim, but I still do not want to give up. Following a two-year hiatus, death row executions are back in Singapore. In the last um, 22 years, 500 executions almost have taken place. Not a single clemency has been granted. The country has some of the strictest drug laws in Asia, where being caught with just one tablespoon of heroin results in a death sentence. People talk as if all these men on, on death row are like hardened criminals, or they talk about them as if they're evil. The majority of the country still supports capital punishment. In 2019, we had a survey that showed very strong support for the death penalty from uh, uh, Singaporeans. <laughs> but a growing number of people are now challenging it. I came today because I think the death penalty should be abolished. In March 2022, the execution of Nagantran Damalingam sparked a wave of protests. In 2010, he had been found trafficking three tablespoons of heroin into the country, but lawyers appealed his sentence on the grounds he was intellectually disabled. On that basis alone, he should not be killed because um, he is a handicapped individual and, and, and that, that, under international law, is against the law. Could the tide be about to turn in Singapore, or will minor drug offenders continue being sent to the gallows to ensure it remains one of the safest countries in Asia? Nazira's brother, Nazari, was sentenced to death in 2017 for trafficking around 35 grams of heroin. Singapore has a zero-tolerance drug policy. Anyone convicted of trafficking drugs, such as anything more than 15 grams of heroin or more than 500 grams of cannabis, may face the death penalty. Nazari has exhausted all legal options and is awaiting execution. Vice World News joins Nazira on what could be her last prison visit to see her brother before he is hanged. When was the last time you saw your brother? Two months ago, before the fasting month. And I, uh, we made a point to try to visit any of my, uh, my sister-in-law, my nephew, the only child that he, my brother has, uh, once a month, every Saturday. We are only allowed to visit him every Saturday. I want to visit my brother, in fact, every day, because his, his days are numbered. He's going off soon if nothing is done. In Singapore, executions are carried out by hanging. The death penalty is also meted out for other crimes, such as murder and firearms-related offences. There are an estimated 60 inmates who are currently on death row. A law and home affairs minister K. Sean Mugam says the country's death penalty is a serious deterrent for drug traffickers who would otherwise bring in larger amounts. He has most Singapore residents. Local authorities say that the death penalty is an effective deterrent for major drug trafficking, making Singapore one of the safest places in the world. According to local activists, family members are typically notified of their loved one's execution date one week prior. How was the visitation just now? Overall, uh, all of us are happy. My brother is uh, looking very radiant, very happy. But only thing, uh, of course, we cannot hug him because there's a glass in front of us. But yeah, uh, he he's very uh, happy to see his only son, only child. He also advised us to be to keep healthy, to be positive. We I have to console myself. I have to change your mindset that if anything happened. Just tell yourself, and I tell myself too, because I'm very upset that you're going to a better place. Nazari was arrested on 13th April 2012. According to his ex-wife, Sheila, who is still visiting him in prison, their failed marriage was largely due to his drug addiction. This is when I married on the 8th of uh, March 1994. 
If you don't mind me asking, why are you still involved and helping him in his life even though you are divorced? Love. The love is still there. You know? Because he always in and out, in and out. But my love with him still in here. Somehow I got son with him. When he in and out and in and out, so it's difficult for us to be together. Honestly, there's no other, there's no other man uh, greater than my dad. Because he's a good man. Uh. Even though he takes drugs or whatever she is doing, right, she doesn't lay hands on my mother or me. My father passed away when he's 45. Lost our major breadwinner. My mom was forced to work at, uh, as a washerwoman and I'm only 16. There's nine of us. The youngest sister was given away. And all my other siblings uh, grew or grew by themselves like a wild plant. But unfortunately, my brother, mixed with a bad company, is hooked to drug at the age of 14. At that time, were you aware of um, Nazari's drug addiction? Uh, yes, I'm aware, but I'm helpless. What, what can I do? I'm only 16 at that time. And my life is that time I focus is just to support the family. It's very tough. As a heavy drug user, Nazari has spent most of his life shuttling in and out of prison. Despite this, he had not managed to stop his drug use. In 2021, Nazari filed for a review application, seeking a psychiatric assessment for his heavy heroin consumption. But it was ruled that there was insufficient material to justify reopening this case. Nazari's only hope was for a presidential pardon. This is a petition of clemency for my brother that I wrote to the president. Petition of clemency. I am directed to refer to the petition of clemency and to inform you that the president, after due consideration of the petition and on the advice of the cabinet, has decided that the sentence of death should stand. So this is the letter I received. M. Ravi has been defending death row inmates pro bono for the past 20 years. He tells me that a presidential clemency is most commonly sought in death sentences when all legal avenues have been exhausted. The clemency process itself has been rendered futile because the state does not exercise clemency since 1998. Until 1998, there were six clemencies were granted from 1965 when Singapore turned independent. So six clemencies only were granted until 1998, but 400 over executions has already taken place by then. And then in the last um, 22 years, 500 executions almost have taken place. Not a single clemency has been granted. On 25th March 2022, Ravi and his co-lawyer, Ms. Violet Neto, were slapped with a $20,000 fine for setting out to delay Megan Chun's controversial execution. The state has come out with a mechanism which is very onerous and harsh on lawyers. Recently, I've been prohibited from practicing, but until the last case was Nagendran's case that I've been involved in. So I've been handling 26 inmates' cases but it's hard to find lawyers now to take over these cases. Why is it difficult to find lawyers? Because lawyers are generally the, are afraid of state reprisals, of especially uh, the kind of work that I've been doing is actually when all avenues are exhausted. So you have very little avenues to save them and it has become a very hopeless stage. It's very, very difficult because a lot of accused persons without knowing their rights, without having lawyers at their side, they succumb easily to the statements, they admit sometimes readily without understanding the parameters. And why are you invested in this cause? First of all, every fibre of my being says that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong about the executions. I don't think that it's right for one human being to take the life of another human being. You know, people commit murders and all these things out of, you know, um, passion of crime and so on and so forth. But for a premeditated murder of an, an entire society on a human being is unacceptable and uh, it's very painful. On 3rd April 2022, close to 400 demonstrators 
turned up in a public rally against the death penalty. This is the only place where Singaporeans are allowed to hold protests legally. The protest, organized by anti-death penalty group Transformative Justice Collective, took place shortly after the execution of Abdul Kaha on 30th March 2022. Kaha's execution marks the first since Singapore's last execution in 2019. You kill that the, the fella, the fella died already, that's it. It's over. But the family, they've been punished, you know, forever until uh, the memory is there and then they are hurt. You know, it's not good, you know, it's very painful, you know, when somebody you love, they kill. I am meeting Kirsten, who has been championing for the abolishment of death penalty since 2010. Along with a group of friends, they started the Transformative Justice Collective, an organization seeking reform in Singapore's criminal justice system. So this is the kind of draft of the letter that TJC helped um, Nazri's sister, Nazira. And then I met up with Nazira and we went to the Istana in person. And Nazira submitted it to, to the Istana in person. What is one thing that struck you the most working with all this or helping the family members? I think it's just such a disjoint between what a lot of members of the public assume to be the case and what the families are actually experiencing and what the situation actually is, right? So people talk as if all these men on, on death row are like hardened criminals or like murderers or like they really talk about them as if they're evil. And what I've seen is that these two categories are not so clearly separated and, and that there are so many levels of like struggle and deprivation and inequality and marginalization that feed into this very complicated issue. There are definitely like death row prisoners who themselves struggle with addiction. Uh, Abdul Kaha, who was executed in March, was like that. He had a lifelong um, addiction to heroin. He was in prison most of his life uh, and, you know, was a user and then was caught and then sentenced to death. And Nazri is also very, very similar, his life story to Kaha. They're very similar age. So it's not so clear, really. It's not always that binary. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually never that binary, I think. So I've been hearing a lot about how you know, the death penalty disproportionately affects the minority races in Singapore. Yeah, so we had to try to figure out ourselves uh, who is on death row and how many people are on death row because the government doesn't put out this information. Many years ago, I tried and I was told by the prison that this is a confidentiality issue. So we had to get researchers and volunteers who literally went and like downloaded all the court judgments to try to figure out who got sentenced, what and where. And I think um, while acknowledging that even that might be incomplete, we think there are about 62 people on death row at the moment. Uh, the vast majority of them being for drug offences are from ethnic minority groups or uh, low-income backgrounds. I've never met a prisoner who was like very privileged. Is there a goal that TJC is working towards with regards to the death penalty? I think we need such a complete relook at how we deal with drugs and drug policies. So there's so much growing body of research to suggest that harm reduction approaches are better and that drugs should be treated as a public health issue and not a criminal issue. Things like addressing the socioeconomic reasons behind why some people might turn to drug use. So, you know, there are people that we encounter in Singapore who say that they started using drugs because they needed to stay awake because they have two jobs. When I hear that, I'm like, the problem is not drugs. The problem is why do you have two jobs? Why do you not get to sleep? You know, why after having two jobs, are you still so poorly paid that you're so stressed? So I think we should be addressing that rather than just be like, oh, you're using drugs, so let's take you to prison. What we hope is to abolish the death penalty, but also within this broader framework of 
changing how we see um, solutions, like what we see as solutions. How hopeful are you that Singapore will abolish the death penalty? Yeah, I'm hopeful that it'll happen. Yeah, I just, I think what, what I worry about is how many more lives will it take for it to happen. In 2019, we had a survey that showed very strong support for the death penalty from uh, uh, Singaporeans. According to studies conducted by the Ministry of Home Affairs, more than 80% of Singaporeans believed that the death penalty is an effective deterrent to serious crimes. I spoke to Luo Ling Lin, a lawyer who defends individuals on death law, to find out why the support for the death penalty persists in Singapore. So if you already have a sentence that is severe enough, I don't think you have a choice. You would have to keep it. There are a lot of voices against the death penalty. It's very easy to just say that I'm against the death penalty. It is cruel, it's inhumane. So do you think Singapore should abolish the death penalty? No, it should not. Because if it's abolished, I think there will be far too many cases. Because if the consequences are not there, I think the drug traffickers will be much more emboldened and it will be much easier for them to recruit new couriers. Because new couriers will have this false mentality that it is okay, I'm not going to die anyway, now that the law has changed. So a common criticism of the death penalty is that it disproportionately affects marginalised communities such as people from the lower income bracket. Do you see that in the cases that you have worked on? Actually, I would agree with that. 100% of my clients are from that bracket. Actually, one of them, the convicted drug trafficker, he had borrowed money from a loan shark. And the loan shark told him, if you transport something for me, I am going to help you minus off what you have owed me. He then decided to do it. Lah. Yeah. He decided to do it because of his economic position. And I don't think it's unfair because he is an example of someone who knew the risk but chose to take on that risk. He chose to do that job knowing that is the risk. It came... The risk materialized, but these traffickers, they had a choice. They could choose to do something else. Just don't do drugs. Just do something else. But I, I still work on the death penalty cases because I believe that because the, the sentence is so severe, all the more, you must fight hard for these people. I feel just as strongly as how these people must go through a fair trial before they are convicted and before their sentences are carried out. Uh, what did your father buy bought for you that day, your children? It was a uh, Puma shoe. Oh, Puma uh, shoe, sports shoe. Uh. He's the one of my best brother, meaning that he's, don't, he's, he's not a violent person. He's on a soft part. Your mother loves you so much, your father loves you so much, you have your auntie who loves you so much. So what else? I see you, I see my brother. I see my brother, I see you. You're my only nephew that I have. Okay, no matter what, we are family. No matter what, we are family. Remember that, all right? I hope that his, the, the sentence is reduced. Of course, on his last remaining years of his life, I want him to be discharged from the prison. I want him to be discharged because another, another 64, another six years is 70. That's make me want to work, uh, want to um, uh, fight for more for this that hoping that the government will not use this matter seriously. You know what I mean?